why don't you know a foreign language no one ever spoke to? You wouldn't expect to wake up tomorrow fluent in Greek, would you? You wouldn't, no. So you need to learn how to do this. And it's the same thing with confrontation. You have to reframe your mind about talking true, right? That's the subtitle of the book, The Essential Guide to Talk True, Be Seen, and Finally Live Free. That talking true is what a professional does. Talking true, because that is the language of success. Hey, I want to start today's episode by thanking you. I want to thank you for being you. I know we talk about how unique everybody is, but you are some kind of special. You are so awesome. You are just so precious. You make the biggest difference in my life. And I just, I want to thank you so much for being here, but really for continuing to show up for you, for your dreams, for your big desires, overcoming everything that you've overcome and are still overcoming so that you can share that unique specialness that you and only you have in the world. So I just want to take a moment, just just put your hand on your heart and just breathe in. (sighs) I am uncomparable. I am uncomparable. I want you to tell yourself that I am uncomparable and I am totally loved. To say it out loud, I am uncomparable and I'm totally loved. It's so important that we women just do the simple things to say and declare out loud to remind ourselves what actually is true. And in today's episode, I'm so delighted and honored to bring to you this guest. My my friend Ashley Stahl recently introduced me to Terry Cole. And this is like queens got to stick together, right? Queens supporting queens. And you are going to love Terry. She's a new friend of mine. She's a licensed psychotherapist. She's a global relationship and empowerment expert. She was on The Real Housewives of New Jersey, which I asked her about in this episode. And she's recently come out with a super cool book. It's the Boundary Boss book. And we talk about her book. You are going to learn so much. But this woman's life, her experiences, her tools, and just who she is as a soul is going to bless you. So enjoy this episode. Soak it all in. And remember, you are uncomparable. Terry Cole, it is such a pleasure to have you here on the Divine Living Podcast. We're going to be talking all things your like totally inspiring career, your brand new book out, and your wise, wise wisdom that I know so many people are going to be blessed with. So thank you so much for being here. Gina D, I'm so happy to be here. (laughs) Cool, cool, cool. Well, I have known about you for years, and I think it was... went back to the days of you being on The Real Housewives. You were like the first person in our space that like broke into that kind of entertainment space also. So can we just have a little fun before we get into the deep substantive topics and talk? Sure. (laughs) What was that like? How'd you get involved with that? And give us a scoop. It was so um, interesting. (laughs) Um, One of my coaching clients um, was on the show, Dina Manzo. And, but she had been my client and then was going back to the show because she was getting a divorce from Tommy and whatever. So she was like, please, they want me to, you know, they want me to like on camera, see someone. It literally has to be you, Tara. Because I really was like, gotta say, I mean, I've never seen her show or any show. I'm not above it. I'm not beneath it. I watch tons of trash TV, just not that, like not reality TV. I watched like Mm -hmm. shows from 1980. Anyway, I, if it wasn't her, I don't know that I would have done it just because I wouldn't have known anybody. Right. So anyway, they have me on. I say, listen, I'll talk to your producer and I'll do it, but I have to, I have to, it has to be like this way or like, I can't do it. So I say to the producer, Hey, we could do it. But like, you get that, like, it's going to be what it actually is. You go, you want to film us talking and if she's okay with that, but you like, you can't script me. Like you get that. They're like, sure. So they filmed so much. There was so little of what we filmed that ended up actually in the show. It's so mm-hmm. funny because of course they're like, uh, can you stop that? Nobody's interested in that. I was like, who the fuck asked you? Like, guess what? My, <laughs> my therapy like, session. <laughs> you're in my office and get out. Like I, w- I wasn't mean about it, but I was definitely like, 
I knew it though. I used to be a talent agent. Mm -hmm. So before I became a psychotherapist, so I was so familiar with that. They were going to say, it's going to be like this. It's going to be great. And then they were literally going to try to put words in my mouth. Anyway, it's fine. They didn't put words in my mouth. They, and they used a very little bit of it because they didn't do what they wanted. And that was totally fine. My whole thing was the reason I did it is because Dina, who I love, asked me to do it. Beautiful, beautiful. Look at you setting boundaries in the toughest <laughs> arena. We're going to get more into boundaries later on in this interview, but good for you. Good for you. Um, next, I got to tell you, Terry, I, like I'm not a TED Talk fan. I don't watch TED Talks. It's just not my thing. I think it's cool that people love them and, and the whole thing. I watched yours. And if you don't turn that into a one woman show, I don't know what I'm going to do. Like it was the best TED talk I've ever seen. I was mesmerized. I was on the floor. I was surprised. It was soulful. It was dramatic. Like it was all the things. So will you tell, we'll, we'll link in the show notes uh, what your TED talk is, but tell, give people a little glimmer of your story, what's in there and kind of what's led you to where you are today. Okay. Well, the TED Talk was based on, um, before I was doing so much about love and boundaries, I talked a lot about fear coming out of this experience that I had. I called it, you know, getting my PhD in fear. There was this period of time in my life where all of these very important things happened at the same time. Important, dramatic, traumatic. So I was graduating from grad school. I had quit my job as a talent agent. I was negotiating contracts for supermodels, celebrities. Like I was literally at the height of my career and I wasn't happy. And I remember my father being like, wait, what? You're quitting your job. What are you doing? <laughs> like, why are you doing that? And I said, he said, sounds weird. That was his advice. He's like, sounds weird. I don't know why you'd quit this job where you're making all this money. You have all of this success, power, whatever it is, not power, but you know what I mean. And to go to grad school to get a hundred grand in debt to NYU, like, why are you doing that? And I said, you know, dad, it sounds weird to you, but I'm not happy or fulfilled. There's definitely something better I could be doing with my life. Again, no diss on entertainment. I love entertainment, but it, I had done what I needed to do there. And what happened in my personal life is I had quit drinking in my early twenties. I was in therapy for a million and 17 years. I learned and was growing and changing so much that I was mesmerized by the transformative power of mental health. Like, I couldn't believe it. I thought it was like a secret. I was like, does everyone know that if you just like figure your shit out, you can do anything? Does Is that like common knowledge? Like, and I just missed the memo somehow. So that was my thing. So the reason I was switching careers and getting out of there is that I could no longer deny that I was way more invested in the happiness and the health of my clients, getting people, women into eating disorder clinics and drug treatment clinics and therapy than I was doing the Pantene deal, the movie deal, whatever it was. So I was like, you need to go. Like you are not interested. Mm. So I decided to go back to school. As I'm graduating grad school, the single most important experience of my life happened. And I met the man who would become my life partner, my husband, Victor. And literally nothing was the same again in my life after that experience because Vic was a widower who had three acting out teenage sons, lived in Elizabeth, New Jersey. Now I'm a single woman in Manhattan living on the Upper West Side, you know, living my best life to a degree, right? Traveling, not, not saving any money, not doing anything mm -hmm. smart financially, but, but literally doing whatever I wanted, pretty much. Mm -hmm. L like having fun, seeing my friends. Then I fell madly in love. And I was a woman who I never really wanted to get married, right? My parents got married young. My mom got pregnant. She, you know, ended up quitting college her freshman year after working in a factory to go to college so she could have money because mm -hmm. my folks grew up poor. So to me, marriage meant like death of death your of dreams, yeah. like dead. They're, they're never coming back. Unconsciously, of course, my mother didn't say that, but she was very clear to be like, get an education girl, make your own money. Mm. and then love can be a choice and not a need one day, hopefully for you, you know? So anyway, it was shocking that I fell madly in love and then I suddenly really wanted to get married. Now, my friends were like, you realize how he lives in New Jersey, which I'm from Jersey, so I love Jersey, mm -hmm. but he lives in Elizabeth, New Jersey, okay? And has three, you know, kids who are having trouble. I was like, here's, I don't even care. Like this guy could have 44 teenagers. I'm wow. so like... 
I can't even believe this guy is single and a human. Like he's so talented, so gorgeous, so smart, so kind, such a decent human being. I'm not kidding. I was like, I, I hit the lottery. I better marry him quick, you know? So I wanted to get married. Like soulmate or twin flame? I, you know, I don't even do the twin flame thing because yeah. there's too much psychological crap that goes with that. Got it. Okay. I say soulmate, but someone I've been around this earth with definitely multiple times because I was like, oh yeah, you are. Mm. Yes. Whatever you're doing, no matter how hard it got, and it did, I'll, I'll sort of shorten this, but it did get hard, right? Three acting out teenage sons. I moved into a frat house, basically this huge Victorian <laughs> home in Elizabeth, New Jersey with boys. And really it's four men because, you know, Ben was the youngest was 12, maybe at the time, but you're still talking about they'd been alone because their mom had died, you know, um, a bunch 12 years before, I guess. So Vic was widowed with a five, a three and a nine month old when his 29 year old wife passed. Yeah. So I came in like 12 years later and it was what it, you think it might've been if they'd been only men for that period of time. So as we're you know just getting into this whole thing of like, I was like, bring it on. I'm going to do it. It's going to be amazing. We're going to redo this house. We're going to, you know, I said to Vic. The man cave. <laughs> I was like, we just orange wallpaper. No, like we just rip up these carpets. You got gorgeous hardwood floors, but we were doing it ourselves. And it was like, let's just, wow. it was sort of like this parallel process where I was getting us all into therapy, them really, right? Because <laughs> I would, I would join sometimes, but the truth is I was not at the scene of the crime, right? Like the stuff that needed to be healed was really between them. And then I would come in because we had, you know, new family agreements and stuff like that. But it was a very rough and painful time. Kids acting out, super angry. Now here I came in. Now I just decided like, I'm not going to, I would never try to replace Donna. That's their mom who passed, who I had this like crazy love affair with her and her spirit. Like, mm. can't explain it. It was like, I knew her. I barely ever, ever talk about that because I know pe some people will think that's so weird, but I would talk to her all the time. Like I had such a connection to her. I still have, I have pictures in my house right now. Vic and I finally live alone, but I just love her because she's part of my family too, right? Without her, my joy wouldn't be here. Anyway, so as we're moving into, this is only the first I don't know, six months of the relationship. Three months in, my, he's about, Vic is about to meet my dad who was living in Florida. Mm -hmm. And my dad got called back for something, even though he was retired, but he had some deals he was doing. So they missed each other by like whatever. And two months later, my father dropped out of a heart attack. So they never got to meet. It was such a drag. Oh. It was very traumatic. Like not ready. Oh, you know, who's ready? He was only 61. So that was the first thing that kind of happened. As I'm cleaning out my dad's house with my three older sisters in Florida and helping his girlfriend do whatever, I find this thing in my throat. And I was like, what is this thing? It was like a lump, but I was like, I don't know, maybe my glands are swollen or something. So my mother said, oh, it's probably a goiter. We have like, it's not serious. It's just a thyroid thing. Go to your doctor. So I go to the doctor, but it's not a goiter. It's actually a cancerous tumor the size of a plum. Oh. So now it's not just that, hi, you have cancer. That sucks. It's you. I now am in this love affair with Victor, who lost his wife to cancer. And these three oh. young boys who I'd been working so hard to gently gain their trust, let them decide how it's going to be like, but they were all, I mean, you know, listen, they were teenagers. So they try to act, they acted like idiots. They fucking loved me, which I knew. They all were madly deeply. So now it was so painful because it wasn't just me being afraid because I was. It was me feeling like, oh my God, how could this happen again? Like Vic is like, what am I, bad luck charm? I'm like, what is the deal? So that was, I don't know, six months in maybe. So go have a whole experience. You get the thing taken out. So radiation surgery. Oh, Terry. And then the same, them, them literally... Six, three months after that, I say to Vic, something feels not right. He's like, what do you mean? I was like, I physically feel fine, but I feel like something's not right. The doctor's like, well, you're nuts and you're hysterical. This is a guy at Sloan who was such a douche. Anyway, um, he's like, you know, there's nothing wrong with you. So I find another surgeon. I tell him the whole thing. And he's like, listen, you know, I have to advise you that most people would not just have the other side taken out. It was my thyroid because of a gut instinct. I was like, okay, that's fine. But what about you? He's like, no, I trust your gut instinct. So let's do it. I was like, okay. 
So I had the same oh, exact surgery. All over. <sighs> oh, Terry. I know. Hi. Same surgery. You're like, oh my God. And I go in now the first time when I went in for the results, for the first time with the guy who was a jerk, I walk in 10 days after the surgery. I'm assuming my motherfucker would call me if there was a problem, right? Wouldn't you think that someone's going to call you? I walk in, he's like, haven't even looked at the pathology yet. That was the bad guy. I was like, I have an idea. Why don't you look at it now? <laughs> he says to me in that moment, oh, that's interesting. Um, yeah, it, so it's malignant. And I was such a cancer virgin. I literally said the words, is that the good one? He was like, um, not exactly. Then he goes on to minimize and say, it's not even that bad. It's not this. It's I wouldn't worry, blah, blah, blah. I was like, you I don't trust at all. So right. you telling me not to worry is not helping. So with the second surgeon, who was amazing and exactly who I needed, a normal person, because when I went in, I said, hey, I need a surgeon who's willing to listen, answer my questions, understand I have a brain. It's my body. It's my choice. Because mm-hmm. I'd had such a bad experience with the first guy. And he was like, I'm definitely your guy. I was like, excellent. Wow. So we do the surgery. Second time I go in, not such a cancer virgin for the results. And he says, interesting. And I said, ah, because you found a malignancy on the other side. And he's like, not only did we find a malignancy on the other side, it's a totally different cancer. And in 38 (gasps) years of doing this, I've never seen this before. And this cancer could move to lungs and bones. (gasps) Like it's a more dangerous cancer. I was like, oh my God. (laughs) Oh, thank God you listened to yourself. Oh my gosh. So anyway, so that happened. And then, so so now we're coming back from this. And I'm trying to also manage the relationship with the kids, right? And being present for them and not trying not to well, look you're sick. Like, were you like scared you might not live? I mean, like... I was, you know, no, because I was, I was being hopeful and I had become very, um, very educated on this. And yes, that second cancer was more dangerous, but still the statistics were good. And I knew that good. if I stayed on it, like I, I, listen, I didn't know anything, but I was well-informed enough at that point good. to be like, I can take it one step at a time and I'm not in the dark. If I have questions, I have a partner now, this surgeon who will talk good. to me. So when that was done, I was like, now I'm now it's heavy, right? Now, now it's a lot. Now all of that energy I've been expending wanting to take care of the boys and Vic, protect everyone from my own thing and my own fear, my mom, my sisters. Now I'm like, wow, this is, I don't know. Like I I was starting to really feel it, right? So then the happiest day of my life or this second happiest day of my life happens. And uh, Vic and I were getting, it got engaged and we were going out and celebrating. And um, we were about to leave to go on this, um, wherever we were going out, we're driving actually a friend back to the city before we went out. And I had to run back into the house because I had to pee. So I ran in and it was like, we had a back deck. And then there was like, the car was this way. It was pitch dark. I could see the two, there was light funnels, you know, that you can see. Mm -hmm. And so I say, I tell the two people, Hey, I'm going to go quick pee and wash my hands. I'll be right back. So while I'm in the bathroom, I I have the window open and I hear Vic simply say my name. He just says, tear. Now, he's a Pisces. He's an extremely patient person. He is not ever rushing me. It was very weird. I got like chills. And I just said, babe, I'll be right out. I, I'm, just, I'm just washing my hands. I'm coming. And I walk out the door. And what I see, I'm trying to make sense of what I see, but I can't make sense of it. So it's, it's like this figure mm. of a, this wedge-like human that I don't recognize. And I can only see them in the funnel of the light. So it was like this weird optical illusion. So I'm walking slowly. And then I look and I realize that this wedge of a human is kneeling on Vic's back and has a gun to the back of his head. I can't even. No. I can't even. Right. Same. So I immediately (laughs) disassociate. And now I can see the scene from, I'm look, I can see the top of my own head. It was the weirdest experience. Never happened in my oh. life, but it happens because our mind is protecting us. And Vic says, um, he, you know, he, he, whatever he says, he wants what you have, whatever, whatever it was that I had in my pocket, I had something. I go, okay. So I was like, we're cool. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. So the person robs whatever they wanted to rob, doesn't shoot Vic, thank God, runs away. And that was literally the end of the, this cumulative thing where I say I got my PhD in fear because I went from being mm. a pretty bold and fearless person 
to being someone who I was having so much post-traumatic syndrome experience. Now, three to six months after a traumatic experience, that's normal. You're going to have intrusive memories. You're going to have dreams. You're not going to be able to sleep. You're going to have uh, um, an, uh, an amplified startle response. Like there's all of these things that as a therapist, even though I was only a new therapist, I knew, right? But my life was getting smaller and smaller and smaller. I was afraid to be alone in my own house. Of course, of with course, my, what a violation. Oh my God, it was terrible. So with my pit bull and my, who, you know, wouldn't save me from anyone. She's like, go check. I'll be right here. Like literally. So I had a dog who I loved and looked scary, but wasn't scary. Sitting knife next to my bed. So this is when I knew I needed to manage my own mind because what was happening is that the fear was here. It was between my ears. It was here. I couldn't stop visualizing what could have happened. Mm. I finally found Vic. I spent my whole life thinking that the kind of connection we had didn't exist or that it just didn't exist for me in this lifetime. But my life was so pretty great. It was okay to to get it because I was already in my 30s. Like I, I thought that whole ship had sailed. I couldn't stop visualizing that person kneeling and that gun and the split second of what could have happened. Mm-mm. It was it was just devastating. And yet, of course, I was so grateful. Nobody got hurt. Like, it, that didn't happen, but my mind was hurt, you know? Sure. So that was, anyway, that was pretty much, that's pretty much what the TED Talk was about. And I've spent the first part of my public facing uh, psychotherapy career really dealing with the mind-body connection to fear. And because I had to heal myself, so trauma work, all kinds of work that I did to heal myself, all kinds of things to to bust through that fear because I really knew I would never live the life that was my dharma and that is my, you know, my purpose in life if I continued to let fear run my mind and run my choices because that's what was happening, you know? Do you consider Uh, yourself healed from that? Oh yeah. And, and as a therapist, when I say healed, I mean, um, I was profoundly and have been profoundly impacted by that experience, but it is just, just part of the fabric of the beautiful Mm -hmm. tapestry that is my life. Mm -hmm. It no longer is a gaping wound. It's no longer a big rip in the fabric. Or afraid to be home alone or. Wow, you did no. the work, woman. You did the work to <sighs> heal, actually heal from that. Whew. Yeah, it was scary. <laughs> it was very scary. But I feel like it was my that was my dharma too, right? Like these things happen, and I never I never look at it like why me? Whether cancer, whether being held up at gunpoint, why not me? <laughs> but look at what. Wow. Everyone in the world experiences, right? Mm-hmm. I'm no different and no, not more special. I mean, my mother thinks I am, but in reality, we're all just humans doing the best that we can. I see these as, um, in a way, I don't want to sound corny to be like, they're like assignments, mm-hmm. but they are. You're like such a <laughs> therapist. You know, like, I don't know, if you're, like, I have a master's degree in clinical psychology. I was a therapist. Like, there's like therapists, but then there's like, the the real ones, the ones that are like, like so lit up about it and so obsessed with it and just like so consume it and live it and breathe it and speak it. And you are definitely one of those. Say it is never not fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Never not fascinating. Oh, all right. Well, let's segue it. Like, so how do you go from getting your PhD in fear to what you're doing today? Share with everyone uh, about your new book, what your body of work is is now about. Okay. So um, what brought me to boundaries, because that that's what I'm, I'm most lit up about right now and have been actually for a lot of years, because I've had a course for five years where I've been sort of beta testing all of what's in the book and my whole life, 25 years in the trenches with my clients is the, what is in this book. You know, what do they say? You teach what you most need to learn, mm-hmm. right? So I had all of these struggles with boundaries. I didn't know that was what they were. I didn't know what to call them in my young life. I was a people pleaser. I was always this personality, positive, lit up by life, super excited to be alive. But I was very dialed into making other people happy, um, being this fix it. I'm always the one people come to. I mean, that's why I became a therapist, partly because I was like, well, at least it'll make sense for them to come to me because now I'm a therapist. But you know, in my younger life, you're paid for it now. (laughs) Exactly. At least you're getting paid. That's correct. 
so the the disease to please, the inability to you know to say saying yes when you want to say no. You know, I, I start out the book with a story that I was a bridesmaid eight times in my twenties. Four of those ugly dress experiences, I should definitely have declined, like for oh, wow. sure, because I allowed those people to think. They loved me and were like, you're my best friend. I'm like, you wouldn't even be invited to my housewarming party. Like, how am I your best friend? Like, how is that possible? If, I mean, if I'd had a house, which I didn't because I was young and poor, but do you know what I mean? So there's pain that comes with that. People don't trust you. You become someone who doesn't keep their word because if you say yes to three people, you can only do one of those things. Or if you say yes, when you want to say no, you do things either begrudgingly or you do them bag at the last minute or do them and then feel like the other person owes you. Like you start to rock that martyr complex, mm-hmm. right? Of like, <laughs> can't believe after everything I've done for that one. I can't believe they're not, you know, and I was like, what is happening to me? You know, it's a recipe for the unlived life. You know, when you say yes. yes, when you want to say no, or when you say no, when you want to say yes, yes, it has, uh, the unlived life just consuming you. Yes, it does. So I started seeing this in my own life, my own progression, because I was in therapy for all, I'm still in therapy, but I was in therapy all of those years. I got into therapy at 19 and literally how you do, I never left, like just didn't leave, just want to stay forever. I'm going to stay forever. So I started doing this in my own life, like learning what it was through the help of these brilliant therapists. And then when I opened my practice, I mean, obviously being in entertainment, not a hotbed of mental health just the worst, just a boundary. Oh my God, terrible because it's so personal and professional mixed. I was in that entertainment industry in the nineties when like, and I was representing supermodels. So imagine, remember, do you remember what was happening with George Michael? And yeah, I like, sadly I took like the, the, I was on the front seat of a pew in a church during that era. So I had a whole different, no, I was at a Holy Spirit rally on a Friday night. So continue. Let everyone else know what that was like. <laughs> <laughs> Many of them probably know. <laughs> well, it, it was a time, right? It was a time where supermodels became this super sought after thing. And it was so interesting. All this happened after I stopped drinking, not doing drugs, not, not doing anything like that anymore. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to miss the boat. Studio 54 for you. <laughs> I mean, all that stuff was so painful at that point in my life. But that experience made me also know boundaries are terrible here. I kept trying to assert myself. Like I was trying to change a business, like this unhealthy, toxic business. And then the business started changing me. And I was like, oh, I need to get out. So that was when I was like, I got to I gotta get out. I got to do something different. In my therapy practice, when I opened that up, even though all this is happening simultaneously, the story I just told you about Vic and the boys was happening at the same time as I was literally putting out my shingle and being like, hi, I have one client. Like (laughs) I'm now a therapist in my studio apartment that I kept in Manhattan so I could use it as an office and I have one client. Then I had 10 and then I had more. Now, most of my clients were Broadway performers because this is you you, from being, you know, being a talent agent to doing this. All, all the casting directors were like, oh my God, you're a shrink. I can't wait to send you everyone. So now I would get one person in a show and then I would have 15 people in that show where I would have to literally say, I cannot take any more clients from Mamma Mia because there's so many showmances that are creating drama in my waiting room. I had to <laughs> stagger this. These two just broke up. This one's bawling her eyes out. Oh my God, I can't. So that was interesting. <laughs> and entertainment is so great though. I mean, I loved, I loved doing what I knew how to do uniquely because of my entertainment experience, but doing the thing I love to do, which was helping people live more empowered, healthier, happier, more satisfying lives. What I saw though, the similarities, it didn't matter who walked in my door, whether it was like the millennial, you know, beauty editor, whether it was the star on Broadway, whomever, every presenting problem could be super different, right? So one comes in and it's like, my family of origin is torturing me and won't let me go. And, but they're also paying for my $5,000, you know, a month apartment. I'm like, yeah, okay. Well, that's the problem. It's, it could be like, my marriage is falling apart. Um, I'm having an eating disorder issue. Every single one of those presenting problems, I could literally like find a pathway back to what was missing, which was this crucial skill set of being able to set and enforce healthy boundaries. Amazing. So 
what that is though. Let's just, can we quickly just say what that is? Yes, please. You know, there's all of these myths, miscommunications and misunderstandings about what it means to be a boundary boss. So it means that you know what your preference is, your desires, your limits, and your deal breakers are. And you have the ability to communicate them when you so choose in your relationships. That's it. Sounds simple enough. (laughs) It is. Well, in theory. theory. (laughs) Which is why in the book, I literally walk you through step one. This is how we're going to figure out who you are and what the state of your boundaries right now. But I took copious notes for 20, over 20 years with my clients, saw these similarities. And I was like, I kept creating like handouts for my clients. I I would come up with these ways to make this theoretical crap actionable and accessible. Great. So how can someone tell if they're having a transference reaction, right? To someone else, right? You're having a reaction in the moment that is actually fueled, right? By an, I mean, I know you know what it is, but I still like, we still got to say what it is, right? Um, fueled by a past experience. So I would come up with like the three cues. You ask yourself these three questions is going to reveal what you might be repeating so you can be mindful in the present moment that you're not 10, your boss is not your father. And there you go. That will help. I want to jump in here. So obviously, we're yeah. going to Terry's um, book links in the show notes. I want every person listening to get this book, if for no other reason than the subject she just mentioned, because so many people um, listening to the Divine Living Podcast are mentors of some sort. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you're a coach, a relationship uh, coach, a health, a weight loss coach, a graphic designer, an interior designer, or a real estate agent. If you're in a service-based business, you are dealing with people, which in my opinion means by definition you are a coach because you're coaching someone to get from one place to another. And most coaches do not have therapist backgrounds, which help you identify this issue which she's talking about with this transference. And so, so many of my clients over the past 20 years have come And you can be blindsided and take on other people's stuff when it has nothing to do with you, Mm -hmm. you know, because somebody is upset that you didn't text them back on a Sunday. One of your clients has nothing to do with you. And so I've just seen so many well-meaning people that are meant to be super successful really fall prey, like shoot down their self-esteem, their their thinking, their ability to like do good work in the world because of somebody else's stuff. So this is an important subject. It is. And and thank you for saying that because it's true. And there's a a self-sabotaging, unconscious process that's happening. So part of what I think is so important about this process that I'm sharing in the book, The Steps, is that I actually walk you down the basement into your unconscious mind, but don't worry, I'm holding your hand. I've got a little miner's light on my head Mm -hmm. because there's info down there that we need. So just like, you know, I'm not anyone's guru. I don't have anyone else's answers, but I literally actually know where your answers are. So I'm a damn good GPS Mm. to get you to the info that you need to have your life in some ways make sense where you go, oh, I have a downloaded boundary blueprint. What is that? Oh, that is the unconscious paradigm in your mind of what you learned growing up in your family system, your culture, your country. And you have a choice whether you go, oh, yeah, that's cool. I like that. Think about uh, a blueprint, a boundary blueprint, as like an architectural blueprint for a house that someone else designed could be a century ago that just gets handed down through Mm -hmm. the generations. And so your job and what we do is we look at it. It isn't about dissing it. It's not about blaming your parental impactors, whoever they may have been. Maybe they did an amazing job. Maybe they did a shit job. You're here now. So like Mm -hmm. we're just going to deal with what that is. But that is part of this process of fundamentally changing your mind about what it means to assert yourself, to be really empowered, to be actually self-determined which is my goal for every single person reading this book. Awesome, awesome. Do you have, I mean, they'll get the book and they're going to get so much out of it. Do you have any tips for one of the weakest areas I see about boundaries in in our community? People are fairly Mm self-aware. They, you know, people are are recovering from Little Miss Perfect, from people pleasing. They've like done done Mm -hmm. some work. 
it's, they know what to say. They're kind of aware of the circumstances, but the inability to actually confront when there's yep. uh, an opportunity for a confrontation. Yeah. I see so many women just like, I'll just, I'll just take it. Like, I'll yep. just, I'll not say anything. I'll just pay more. I'll just do more work. I won't um, force them to own that part of the contract. Yep. What tips do you have for women who are too afraid to confront? Oh, just rather take it on themselves. Gina, you bring up such an amazingly good point. And it's so important that the way that most of us were raised, we were raised and praised for being self-abandoning codependents. Boom. Everybody stop. That, I don't want it to be a bumper sticker, but it needs to be. Terry, that is gold. Keep going. Okay. Fact. So when you go, why can't I do this? What's wrong with me? I'm weak. I'm whatever. It's like, why don't you know a foreign language? No one ever spoke to you. You wouldn't expect to wake up tomorrow fluent in Greek, would you? You wouldn't. No. So you need to learn how to do this. And it's the same thing with confrontation. So in the book I teach you, there's ways. I'm going to tell you things you can do right now to make it better. And then when you get the book, you're going to get, and I'm also have a gift for you guys that will help as well. You have to reframe your mind about talking true, right? That's the subtitle of the book, The Essential Guide to Talk True, Be Seen, and Finally Live Free. That talking true is what a professional does. Talking true, because that is the language of success. And you can do it with kindness, and you can do it with love, if, if it's appropriate. And you can do it with a little fire, if need be, if it's appropriate. But you, you don't, you're not going to suddenly become a different person. So desensitizing yourself to this fear. And part of that is going back and going, why? Why am I this way? When you do the, you, you'll do your own um, download a boundary blueprint in the book itself. You start to see, oh, look, my mother was a people pleaser. Mm -hmm. my, my maternal impactor or whoever the people, the adults in your life were. But there are reasons you are this way. So you're going to change your mind about what it is. And you're going to stop anticipating the other person's response and reaction. You're going to dial back into you, your side of the street. Because what happens is we're so empathic. We're very tuned in to the feeling states, a slight shift in the facial expression of someone else. And I notice when I was younger, I would notice and I would be afraid. Hmm. Did I just say something to make them mad? Are they thinking this about me? All this, again, mm -hmm. this guessing and this projection, our worst fears, we're now saying, oh, that's what that person is thinking. So part of it is you're changing your mind about what it means to talk true. We're not going to call it con confronting. You're not like grabbing like a megaphone and being like, everybody, we need to talk now that you become a boundary boss, right? Because you're going to do it with ease and grace. So you're going to start small with non-priority people. Great so, tip. right? Like that's, that's it. You're going to start small with non-priority people. If the food isn't what you ordered, well, can send it back nicely. Stop eating what you didn't order, please. Mm -hmm. Stop sucking it up. Stop saying it's okay. And thinking that I'm easy, no fuss, no muss. You know me, it's all good. That is not a badge of honor. And it's not fucking true. And you don't have to start with your mother. Yeah. <laughs> and please don't. Please do not. But if you think about it, you know, G, if you think about it this way, your preferences, your desires, your needs, your dreams, your limits, and your deal breakers, right? Mm -hmm. These are the things that actually make you uniquely you. Yes, preach. Right? And that's what, when we hide those things, what are we doing? We're giving the people in our life corrupted intel on us when we say yes and we want to say no. And then we bitch about them. Right? I, so, I realize it's manipulative. I realized. When I was recovering from my own codependency, when I thought I was saying the thing that other people wanted to hear, 
I thought it was because they would then be happy. (laughs) And when I got underneath it, I was like, Gina, you are so manipulative. You're just figuring out what you can do to get these people to like you. Has nothing to do with their happiness, you little scoundrel. Like, I was in shock that, like, I thought I was so all about everybody else when it was all about me. It was earth shattering. Oh, my God. Gina, that's so funny because it's so common where... I remember this this situation I had with my my therapist. I had um, one of my my siblings was always in an, a, a bad situation, just bad abusive relationships. She was, had addiction issues, so I had but I would going into therapy crying. I'm going to send her money. I'm going to do this. I'm going to help. She was. This is a true story, and it was terrible at the time. It was many many years ago, and she's none of this is happening now. So, she was living in the woods without running water, with someone on crack who was physically abusive. Literally no embellishing. That was the actual fucking truth of the story. So I say to my therapist, oh my God, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm so, I mean, everything about this particular says, I was like, mm, I'm taking this on. I have to do it. I was the hero child in my family. You just got to do the things. And she said to my face, hey, Terry, let me ask you something. What makes you think that you know what lessons Jenna needs to learn? in this lifetime. And I was like, well, I think we could both agree she doesn't have to learn it by living with a crackhead who beats her with no water in the woods. (laughs) And she said, no, actually, you know what? I can't agree with that because I have no idea what she needs to learn. This is what's happening to her. You've worked for 20 years to create internal peace and a harmonious life. Your sister's life being a dumpster fire is completely fucking with your peace. You really <laughs> want your pain to end. You want your pain mm-hmm. to end. Ooh, ooh, ooh. We'll also put that therapist number in the show notes. <laughs> I like, oh, my God. So that changes it from like exactly what you said, you scoundrel, right? It changes the mindset from... I'm just giving like that and loving like that. And, oh, I'm just manipulative and controlling like that. And the truth was, it was, I did not know. Mm -hmm. So I was so relieved. The moment I knew, I said, wait, so I could still be a good sister, even if I don't do those things. She's like, Terry, you can't. Like, it is an impossible task that you're, you're thinking that you can do. You can't. She will make those things. She will do it. So you have to draw the boundaries that make sense for you. So I did said to her, hey, I love you. I cannot listen to you tell me about what these bad things that are happening because you keep saying you're not going to believe what this idiot did. And I'm, I'm believing it every time. I don't know why you're surprised because he's been the same exact way the whole time you've been with him. Let's, I want to, you know, step back from talking all the time. And if and when you ever actually want to get out, get out, like action, you're ready to take action. Of course, I'm here for you. And nine months later, she's like, I'm ready. I was like, okay. Mm. And that was, never went back. She's doing great. She's been sober. She's all the things. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. You know, um, and maybe I'll ask you one last question and then we're going to talk about your um, links where we follow you, get your book, the free gift and all. Yeah. All Everything that you mentioned about these elements of boundaries, mm-hmm. of like what your non-negotiables are, your preferences are, speaking up, speaking your true word. I learned all of that from my husband. Mm-hmm. Like, is there a thing with men different than women? Like, my husband would, n- he's not like, when you're like, what do you want from dinner? He's like, whatever you want, said he never. Like, what what do you want for dinner? Steak. (laughs) You know, like, what do you want to do tonight? Stay in. Like, it's like, he has zero issue on unapologetically, you know, sometimes I have to go as far as no filter Fred, or I call him the anti-brand of divine living because he doesn't care. Like, he's going to be true to himself no matter what, no matter the circumstance, any of it. Yep. So is there, in my experience... There is, if we're talking about sort of uh, heterosexual um, gender roles mm-hmm. in a more normative way that like, you know, sort of more old school, like men are from whatever, women are from Venus, Mars, that one, right? Mm-hmm. In my actual experience, there's some truth to that. 
because if we look at it from the societal point of view, boys are raised to be independent, to be leaders, to mm-hmm. speak their mind. If they say something, they're they're leading, they're decisive. There's all these great words we use and a woman does it and she's a bitch and she's hysterical and she's a shrew and she's all of these things. Mm-hmm. Listen, and I'm not saying, you know, they didn't also have the problems with all of this role conformity that was expected of them. Don't cry. All of those things mm-hmm. are not great either. And I don't think that all men are like your husband. My husband is a Pisces and he's he's much more mellow and he raised kids alone until I got there. So he's the guy when I met him who's like, I can, I'm going to make dinner. I'm going to make sure you went to the bathroom before we get in the car. Mm. He's like, do you have to pee? I'm like, I've literally never been on a date (laughs) where anyone asked me if I had to pee before we got in the car. (laughs) He's going to get a stain out of your sweater (laughs) like that. So he had to do both. I don't think when he was Mm -hmm. 20, he could have done both. But there is something about the way that we were raised that makes that make so much sense. But things are changing. And this boundary revolution that this, right, April 20th, right now, this is the start. And we are inviting every single one of you listening to become a part of this. Literally, we're going to change the world because we have to stop the cycle of people pleasing. This next generation of humans and of women in particular, and I love men, but my work is, you know, mostly female empowerment because it's Mm -hmm. what I know. We we are the ones we've been waiting for. Like, mm-hmm. is I don't think the Aquarian age is going to take it. Quite frankly, like it's just so much about truth, like real truth, like higher truth. Mm-hmm. Um, that it's like you can't even like play the game anymore. It feels like it, you know it's so interesting. I had a client say to me the other day about this, and she's so cute because she's <laughs> she uses all the language in the book, you know. And she was like, you know, Terry, it is so hard for my friend, Betty, to talk true. She just can't talk true ever. And now that I know how to talk true, I can't not. So we're having a little bit of conflict. (laughs) And I was laughing so hard because I was like, oh my God, that's so cute. She's using the vernacular from the book. Like, yes, yes, please. Well done, Terry. Well (laughs) done. So um, tell everyone, uh, again, the name of the book, we'll put the the links on where they can buy the book below. So let's do that. So the name of the book is Boundary Boss, The Essential Guide to Talk True, Be Seen, and Finally Live Free. You can go to boundarybossbook.com and you can buy it from anywhere, but come back and put your little receipt in, in step two. And I have so many, I just couldn't stop adding bonuses. I have so much beautiful free content for you just for buying the book because I really want you to become a boundary boss because the world needs it. So there's that. My website is terrycole.com. Your gift, let's talk about that. Yes, let's talk about this free gift. It's awesome. You're going to love it. But where you're going to find it is boundaryboss.me forward slash divine. Is that is that a good moniker? Yes. You like that? Yes, yes. My my people will resonate for sure. Terry, you talk about just such a boss. We, you know, our vernacular around here is queen. What a queen you are. Thank you so much for just such soul generosity of sharing your mm. life, your process, your wisdom, your humor, your personality. I'm just, I know I'm uplifted and enriched. I know everyone oh, listening goodness. is as well. Well, thank you for having me. I super enjoyed it. Good, good, good. All right, everyone, go get that book right now and uh, follow Terry and make sure you get the free gift too. See, I told you you'd love her. How fun was that episode? And isn't getting great at boundaries just so, 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 so exciting? I mean, I mean. Yes. Well, Queen, if you want more help in speaking the truth and love and more support around boundaries and just getting to know yourself more, I want to see you in the Q Club. Have you heard about it? It is the social network for all things Queen, for women like us. You can check it out at divineliving.com forward slash Q Club. And it's just a place that I wanted for women like us to be able to connect, not in the whole comparison-itis, noisy, you know, polarizing all the other busyness of the other social networks, but a place where women like us can play and connect and be seen and be loved. And then also in there, it's like a whole Gina DeVee, 
Netflix, a library of videos from my live events to different subjects, also on boundaries and making up your own rules that you're going to live life by. And there's fun cooking segments and there's lifestyle things, but there's also like spiritual segments and prayers and meditations. So it's super affordable. Come on and join us in the Q Club. You can try it out. You can cancel it anytime. You won't want to. Go check it out, divineliving.com forward slash Q Club. And until next time, Queen, lots of love.